I want to just give you a quick, you know, to make sure that you can relate it to what we did yesterday. I think it's important for you to see. So you remember yesterday we looked at static, uh, sorry, deterministic Nash games. Today we're interested in looking at stochastic Nash games, right? So this is what each player's objective is. It's an expectation valued objective. And you'd have So how did we how did we analyze this problem yesterday? What did we do yesterday? Right on the first all optimality conditions, right? So the optimality conditions of this would be what? The variational inequality that corresponds to the gradient of the expectation of theta 1 x omega. And here is the variational inequality gradient of theta 2 x omega. Okay? Not theta to theta n, sorry. So this can be collectively written as some larger variational inequality given by x, this is x1, xn. So you have an x and f of x, this is called f, where f x is defined as the gradient of So just as we had a stochastic optimization problem, we have a stochastic variational inequality problem. Okay? And I'm going to talk a bit about those, but before I do that, I want to just expose you to this framework. Okay? So now, solving this is obviously a little more, but before we talk about solving this, we also have to talk about when do these types of objects admit solutions. Right? So the two questions here, one is solving these objects. And the second is, uh, sorry, um, when do these have, have solutions? Um, and when they do have a solution, how do we compute such a solution, right? Um, so there, there's some extra stuff here which I'm not going to kind of do. I want to just move through. So there's some stuff now that you'll see which, so these are sampling methods. They're different methods for solving stochastic optimization problems. So why would you worry about that? If you're trying to solve this Nash game, there are several ways to solve it. One is a decentralized approach where each player takes a decision and all the other players respond. That's called, often called a tautonoma approach where you're looking at players making and Arnaud can translate that into English, right? So it's basically the sequence of steps that players take and you reach an equilibrium. Right? Best response schemes fall within this regime. Each player takes a step, every player, and, and that's an asynchronous regime, or you could have a synchronous best response. Where everybody simultaneously takes a best response step. Um, you could also have gradient response. Everybody takes a gradient step, and then you, know, you keep updating. There's also an offline scheme. The offline scheme would then directly solve this problem. Right? Just as we directly solved vi x comma f, you could directly solve the stochastic version. Okay? Now, if you, want to solve, if you want to solve it using this approach, each agent has to figure out how to solve this problem at any given point in time. And that's where you need to use standard stochastic, approximation, uh, stochastic optimization schemes. So I don't want to spend too much time, but I want to just give you one or two pictures just to understand how to solve these. Um, right, because not all of you are going to solve these types of problems in terms of actually developing algorithms, but it's useful to know how to solve them. So remember I have a script qx which is the recourse function. So the way you solve this is this recourse function can be written, this function actually looks it's basically a convex function and there's a finite number of scenarios in the true problem 
it is basically a piecewise linear convex function. The problem is that each of these cuts or edges requires you to solve an optimization problem. So what do cutting plane methods do? Cutting plane methods will solve a sequence of problems of this form. So what, what that means is you solve a problem, let me show you, let me show you graphically what happens. Okay? I solve a problem and it turns out, and there's already, these are two cuts, it turns out I come here. In the next step, I use this to generate another cut. Once I generate another, sorry, it shouldn't be like this, something like this. I generate another cut, it turns out I move here. Okay? I generate another cut. So I keep generating cuts till I get a clear, and at some point, I have, within the algorithm, I have something that generates upper and lower bounds. So the upper bound and the lower bound keep coming closer and closer. At some point, they're within a threshold, you terminate. Okay? That's a standard approach for solving two-stage stochastic linear and convex optimization problems. Okay. Now, when you have um, general measure spaces, then these cuts are actually, they use some sampled information and there's a slight variant in terms of how this is done. It's a little more intricate. Okay, so that's method one. I want to just draw a picture so you understand the three methods out there. And after that, you know, whether or not you use them is, is, is not the point. I want to make sure you leave with that understanding. So you have... So the first method is cutting plane methods. Right? Cutting plane methods. And the idea is that you solve a sequence of these problems. Right? And you have an upper bound goes down, a lower bound that goes up, and at some point you stop. Okay? The second approach is called sample average approximation. Sample average approximation takes the original problem and it approximates it with a sample average problem. And the sample average problem is basically just takes the expectation and approximates it with a sample average. Now, this is a deterministic optimization problem. It's still not easy to solve because once you submit it to MATLAB, if you want to use a Newton method at every step, you need n Hessians. If you use a gradient method, you need to average n gradients at every time. And you get an estimator xn, and then there are statements like this that are available. This is an exponential convergence rate you can get. But, you know, so people prove these types of statements, and the reason they prove these is because you need to know how large your n should be so as to get an error that you desire, right? Suppose you have a nasty problem and you don't have a large enough n, then you just get a very poor solution. On the other hand, if you have a very simple distribution and you take very large samples, a uh, very large number of samples, it may be unnecessary. Okay? So sample aver average approximation basically takes this problem, constructs an approximate problem, solves it just using your standard solvers, and then the theory starts kind of focusing on, as n goes to infinity, can you say something about whether this, this is called an estimator, uh, this converges to its true counterpart, and what is the error in terms of n. Yes, Valbir. Is this what is known as a stochastic um, uh, scenario approach? Where we just discretize. Uh, so there are different ways. To, so this is a sample average approximation where there's a Monte Carlo sampling theory behind it. The scenario approach often just says, I just generate scenarios, I just solve that problem as a, you know, assume that it's deterministic. They don't always look at these questions. So the term sample average approximation is a little more encapsulating. Yeah. The third approach 
is using stochastic approximation. And stochastic approximation, what it does, the third approach, and this is quite is also very popular. And towards the end, so one of my goals was to give you uh, a smattering of theory regarding this, but we'll see if we have time regarding this at the end. So if you remember yesterday, we had a gradient method. So the gradient method for this is just, instead of the gradient, you use the sample gradient. So very little changes, okay? So every step, you use a sample gradient. You have an oracle that gives you a sample gradient. If you if your sum if your gamma k is infinite and gamma k squared finite then it implies under some conditions that x k converges to x star almost surely so what so don't worry about almost surely is just a because these are random variables you need to provide a probabilistic convergence statement so almost surely specifies that and you can in strongly convex settings you can say Okay, so you have some error bound. Okay, so this is a sublinear error bound. Now you can see this is much worse than what we had. In the deterministic world, what did we have? We proved that we had xk minus x star squared was less than what? Q raised to k, right? So this was a linear convergence rate for deterministic. For stochastic, it becomes much, much poorer. And that's just the reality of dealing with noise, right? Because this is this can be viewed as the true gradient plus some noise and this noise slows down the process okay so these are three approaches that are generally employed for solving these types of problems this one is easily adapted to stochastic nash games so we've done work and others have done work on solving these this is also easily adapted to solving stochastic BIs. And this is less because this requires the optimization structure. Right? It looks at posing the problem as a convex optimization problem. That's not always the case. Our problems are VIs, right? So it's hard to do that. Okay, so is this clear? I want to make sure that everybody just leaves with an understanding how they would approach these problems. Because in a lot of cases, for very large instances, conventional solvers will not suffice. You won't be able to just process this through MATLAB, through your, it's, it's going to take a little more work, okay? Um, okay, I'm not going to do robust optimization. I want to talk about stochastic variational inequality problems now, okay? So, so you remember we talked about this, just a quick recap. So we had a, you're minimizing a convex function over a closed and convex set. Now x is a solution of OPT if and only if x is a solution to the variational inequality problem vi x comma gradient of f. Remember that variational inequality x comma f requires an x such that y minus x transpose f of x is non-negative for all x and f. Now, the stochastic generalization of OPT is given by this problem, right? So now it's a stochastic optimization problem. So the stochastic, the optimality conditions of this, the necessary and sufficient, sufficient conditions are captured by VI x comma f, where f is still deterministic, but it's expectation value. So remember, once you've taken the expectation, the function is deterministic. The stochastic part comes in because we sample, right? If you could evaluate the expectation, that problem is identical to the one I could, you know, if you had a closed form expression for the expectation, that problem is indistinguishable from the problem that you solved yesterday. The challenge is, is entirely in not being able to evaluate the expectation or even, so, so forget even differentiating, even evaluating, okay? Now, unfortunately, stochastic convex optimization approaches cannot be directly um, extended. And the reason is, one reason, 
is that in optimization, we have a function that tells us how the scheme is doing. In variational inequalities, we don't always have that, particularly in strongly monotone regimes. So we have to use a gap function. So lots of the theory needs to be reworked. And that has been, a lot of it has been reworked. Now, a, a lot of the results are currently available for maps that are pseudo, -mon uh, sorry, monotone. So remember what a monotone map is? A monotone map is one where y minus x transpose fy minus fx is non-negative for all y and x in the set. Okay. Uh, I want to just go into, hang on a second. Okay. So let me just tell you which part I'm going to do now. Um, I'm just going ahead, I just want to see which part I want to tell you about. Okay, so okay, so I want to just give you a quick blurb regarding the structure of these problems, so you understand them because I think it's useful for modeling. So and I'm going to relate these to electricity markets. Okay, so if you look at this, this is the first stage problem. In your world, that would be like a day ahead problem. Uh, so let's say you're thinking about vehicular stuff, this would be essentially what an aggregator would submit in the day ahead. As soon as the real time arises, the concern is that you need to make sure, so this is called the tender matrix. What this does is it says, well, this could be deterministic or, or random, but essentially you need to relate your first stage decision with your recourse decision, so as to meet some requirement. Now, there might be some, some requirement that you have to meet, or it might just be that you need to meet some consistency requirements, right? So, for instance, in, in certain markets, there's a demand requirement you're trying to meet. Maybe that's what shows up here. In other settings, you have a capacity here. You need to make sure that your first stage plus any modification satisfies your random capacity requirements, right? So, for instance, in, in, in your problem, it might be that You've been told by the aggregator in real time, this is what I have access to in terms of number of cars, right? So that's what shows up here in terms of B omega. Um, and so this problem, if you're looking at larger wholesale markets, it may be that you have, uh, you have information about the outages of generators. All of that gets encoded here. If you have information about the wind availability, that gets encoded here. When you make the decisions regarding these at, in the day ahead, you don't have that information. You only have it in some distributional sense. Okay. What about these costs? These costs are the costs of changing. So, for instance, in, in certain markets, this cost might be zero. In other markets, it might be to deviate. So, for instance, ISO New England says that if you want to change your decision from your day ahead decision, I'm going to charge you a convex deviation penalty. So, it's not even linear, it's convex. Right? There are other markets, markets where they actually have a nasty deviation penalty which is zero for the first 10 and jumps. Okay? And that actually requires the use of integer decisions, but we can't do that, so we smooth it in some way. Okay? So there are lots of settings where you can model this within a linear setting. Sometimes you have to move to a nonlinear, and sometimes it's even nastier, it's integer. Right? So you have to deal with that. Questions? So, okay, um, what I want to make point out, right, as, as folks who are going to model using this approach, what you want to know is what aspects of these, these mod this structure is sacrosanct and allows you to maintain the structure of this. Because what is the big thing you need? You need to make sure Q script X is convex. If Q script X becomes non-convex, then the problem becomes nasty. Now, does that mean we should stay away from non-convex problems? Not really. But to the extent possible, if it's a modeling question, maybe you should try. Now, if it turns out there's something which is core to your problem, stay with, you know, you need to, you need to make, maintain the fidelity of your application. Okay. So then, before I proceed, I want to make sure that everybody understands what it is that, um, so I don't want to go into the theory of this, but I want to just tell you, yeah, this is what I wanted to say. So if you look at the recourse function, this is a question that Jalal asked earlier. The recourse function, which is this function, remember I told you about this function? The random recourse function is actually a piecewise linear convex function. It's a piecewise linear convex function in H and T, where H and T, if you remember, 
is the information associated with, so this is H and T, H and T, oh, so this, sorry, this should have been H here. So H and T, if you change H and T, this is basically a piecewise linear function. Um, and what is most important is it's, it's convex in X, okay, and K2 is basically the set of recourse decisions. So one thing that you have to remember, right, this is also important. Stochastic programming problems have this notion of that you need to define in terms of the, the recourse properties. So suppose I told you that the day head decision is 100 and it turns out that your, your capacity, the only capacity that you can bring on in the real time is an incremental capacity is only 20. But the demand happens to be 130. What happens? So your demand for a particular realization is 130. You have day ahead, a day ahead bid of 100, which means you have some firm capacity. You can bring on an extra 20. So what's going to happen? You need to meet 130. Yeah, well, that, that could be the case if you're, if you're short. But the point is that from that's the standpoint of the sol solving this problem, you're infeasible. Right? There's no feasible solution to this problem. So as a consequence, whenever we model these types of recourse problems, you need to be careful about whether you have what is called the type of recourse that you have. So I'm going to give you one notion of recourse. So, there's one notion of recourse called complete recourse. Complete recourse means for every first, any first stage decision, X, and this is an Rn, there exists a Y such that second stage problem with respect to omega is feasible. So you design your framework such that what I just said cannot happen, right? So that would violate recourse, right? So you have a situation where you can always take recourse. Now you can weaken this to something called relatively complete recourse. And in this case, this becomes for any x in the first stage feasible region, the second stage is feasible. And that's, this is a common assumption that we use. It's a weakening of complete recourse, um, and it's called relatively complete recourse. So whenever you design these two-stage structures, you need to comment on the types of recourse properties that they are endowed with. Okay? Because if you don't, or if you're not careful about it, if you actually try to solve this problem, Something weird might happen where the second stage problem becomes infeasible and as a consequence solutions aren't defined, just lots of the properties for the functions go away. So you have to be very careful. Okay? So you need to make sure that somehow you always maintain feasibility in the second stage. Right? Because the second stage, and, and why is that? Because Q script X relies on solving the second stage problem. If you don't solve the second stage problem, what do you put up there? Well, you could always put plus infinity up there, but that doesn't help you very much, right? Okay. Okay. So then, and so a lot of this is to relate the recourse properties to the continuity properties. That's something that, that we do. Um, okay. Let me show you something else. Well, this is some, okay. The next question is, if I gave you a recourse function, how, you know, so remember I told you just now, I said, if I gave you this problem and I said, how do you compute a gradient, right? If I gave you this problem, so Arnaud had a good point that if you have a lot of structure, maybe computing the gradient is easy. But in general, how do you compute the gradient? If I told you, 
Suppose I told you there's no uncertainty, but Q script X is a solution to some optimization problem defined as minimize D transpose Y um, TX plus W Y is equal to H Y is non-negative. So basically what you have is a second stage problem. And now I'm asking you, why, and why do I care about gradients? I care about gradients because I need to use this in a gradient method, right? I need to use it in a gradient method. So I need to know how to get a gradient of this. I know how to differentiate this guy because I have it in closed form. I can just use calculus. How do I differentiate this guy? So the way I differentiate this guy, so the first thing is that I told you that Q script X is piecewise linear. So my first question is, is it differentiable everywhere? The answer is no, because you've got these kinks. But we know that it's what is called sub-differentiable. And what I mean by that is that there are sub-gradients that are available. Okay? And the sub-gradient of that recourse function requires you to get a solution of the second stage problem. Thank you, Gwen. Right, requires you to get a solution to this problem. So this subgradient, this subgradient is so um, I want to see if I've defined that here. Okay, let me show you. Uh, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to burden you too much with the analysis, but this is what the recourse function is. It's the minimum of Q transpose Y subject to these constraints. Okay, I can write the right hand side in terms of X as just W Y by taking all this. So this is the first stage information. Now, when I differentiate the recourse function or get a subgradient, what is it with respect to? It's with respect to the first stage decision. So I need to differentiate the minimum value with respect to chi, which is a function of x. Right? And so the analysis we have to use is a little more elaborate, but I want to just take you here. So the first thing you want to remember, and so one thing I would encourage is that if you're, you know, if you're in this field, you'll probably end up taking a course on optimization. And in the course on optimization, what you see is duality theory. So this is a linear program. The optimal value of a linear program is the optimal value of its dual, assuming that both are feasible. Right? So if you had minimize C transpose X, AX equals B, X non-negative, and if the Lagrange multiplier is pi, I can write down what I call the dual problem in, let's call this lambda, and that dual problem is formulated in this fashion. It uses the same data, but it's a different problem. It's in the lambda space, okay? And what we have is C transpose X is greater than B transpose lambda, and at the optimal solution, you have C transpose X star is B transpose lambda star. Okay, why is that important? It's very important because once you write the dual, then computing the subgradients of this, computing the subgradients of this value function, just come down to the chain rule applied to the objective. So what you end up is you remember chi was what is chi? Chi was h minus t x. So when you take the subgradient of this, it's the chain rule, which is minus t transpose pi star of x. That's the subgradient. Okay, I've skipped some of the theory, but what you notice is to get the subgradient, I just need to solve the dual problem, and I hit it with t. That's it. So solving the so because it's pointless if I give you an algorithm. And I've been telling you all this time and, you know, moaning on and on about why the expectation is hard to compute, right? But I have to give you a way to deal with it, right? 
The way to deal with it is for the sample. And now this is assuming that there's no uncertainty. If there is uncertainty, now you do this for the sampled problem. So you get a sample gradient. And you use the sample gradient here. Okay. So at every stage, you take a first stage decision, you, you know, and using this gradient, and the second stage gradient, solve the second stage dual problem, plug it back in, and you're good to go. Okay. Now, you may not remember the algorithm. What you need to just remember is that it's doable. You can do it. Okay. So there's so here we really go into the the definition of the subgradients. Okay, I, I don't want to do that here. Uh, just so that you guys remember what a subgradient is. Okay, so for those of you who have not seen subgradients before, I thought I'd put a slide or two about subgradients. So all of you are familiar with gradients, right? All of you are familiar with gradients. When you have functions which are not necessarily differentiable. Right? Then you have the notion of a subgradient. Right? So, so, so normally, so you define a subgradient as a z, right? And what is a subgradient? It's just saying, what did I use there? F x0. Okay, let me give you an idea of what that means. So if I have a convex function, remember I told you, I give you some properties of convex functions. So if this is f of x, what is this, the equation of this line, if this is x0? The equation of this line is f of x0 plus the gradient. If the gradient is gradient of x, f of x0 transpose x minus x0 for any x, right? Does everybody agree? Right? And what do we know for a convex function? We know for a convex function that f of x is greater than f of x0 plus gradient of f of x0 transpose x minus x0. Right? So it's just this function is always above these tangents. Okay? Now suppose I change the function. The function was smooth, right? Suppose I make the function this. Okay? So if I make the function, so now if I take a point here, this still holds, but I could take this, all of these would be subgradients. Because for all of these, that property holds. You have a you don't have the tangency property because now you have a kink, but what you can do is you can take a host of these and all of them satisfy that property. And what is a subgradient? A subgradient is this choice that allows for that to happen. Okay, because here there's no derivative. If I differentiate something here, the derivative is not defined. What is defined is the subgradient. And physically, what is the subgradient? It's just that. So it's not going to be unique. It's not going to be unique. You can take the subgradient z lies in a set, and that's the subdifferential at f. Okay. So it's the set of vectors that satisfy that property. The set of subgradients is referred to as a subdifferential, and it's just the set of vectors z that satisfy this property. Now you can't, if Priyanka pulls out some random vector, it won't satisfy that, right? So the only vectors that satisfy that are the ones that are corresponding to these lines, right? the continuum of these lines. Any line that does that, all the way from here to here, you keep swiveling it, the slopes on those are the z's. Is that clear? Farzana? So let me give you an example. If I took the absolute value function, right? The absolute value function is differentiable, is, it loses differentiability at what point? At zero, right? So if you take the absolute value function, so what, what is the gradient of the absolute value function here? Minus 1, and here it's plus 1. The only problem is here. Now, if you look at it here, what is this gradient? Minus 1. And what are the lines I told you that you could take? 
right? So, and what is this slope? One. So let's look at this. So the subdifferential is the compact interval between minus one and plus one. Okay. Does everybody see this? Gwen, do you see this? So basically, all it's saying is it's giving you the interval. Now, in this particular case, the slope is in one dimension. Now, if I gave you a more complicated function, the slope might be in multiple dimensions, right? Because the, the space is, uh, you know, it's, it's a n, in n space. Then you'll get basically a set. Okay. Let's consider a different function, max of x comma 0. If you took max of x comma 0, you get this function. Okay. What is this slope, Olivia? 0, right? And this is 1, right? And now I'm looking at Right? And so what do you get? Exactly 0, 1. Okay? So the reason I'm, I'm giving you this information is because in a lot of cases, so Fabio brought up this case of the conditional value at risk. Right? So the conditional value at risk is a, is a non-smooth function that looks like, that looks like this. So... Um, Plus, sorry, some, uh, I've forgotten what is it? It uh, has plus one upon alpha undefined. I think this is it, right? Where m is the value at risk. But what is important is can you get subgradients of this? You can, because it's got such a clean form. So the point is, and so Fabio, the point I wanted to make was. For this function, right, this function, and x is, so this is going to be some h of x omega. For you to differentiate this is not particularly difficult because you know that there's only a kink where h of x omega is equal to m. It's differentiable everywhere else, right? So you can use what is called a stochastic approximation scheme where you get random subgradients. Each of the subgradients can be constructed because you know the structure. Okay, and I'll, I'll do an example where I think I have risk in the example to analyze it, right? You have a question? Maybe. <laughs> okay, so, so the point I'm making is that this function, let's call this function some g of x omega. Now, if I give you a general function, it's, it's hard to differentiate, but this function, remember m is a variable and x is a variable. Yeah. Is another positive part function or absolute values. So my age is. Okay. Uh, but that's okay. You can still use chain rule on it. Right? Do you know that? Uh, so it's, it's, if it's a max function, is it a max of a differentiable function and something else? Yeah, yeah. then instead it's, it's uh, even a fine, I guess. But then the problem is if you relax, if I relax this age, mm -hmm. let's say it's an absolute value, mm -hmm. I can still take the algebra of relaxation, right? However, yeah. since that is not directly my objective function, but it's inside the C bar, I figure out there are some cases where the that relaxation, the apical relaxation is not tight anymore. And then I'm not entirely sure why. I guess so, so but but what you're trying to do is you're trying to relax the problem by adding constraints. Right? You're trying to do that. But your expectation is still over a general distribution, right? Mm -hmm. How are you dealing with this? Are you just using a scenario? Yeah, I have like a okay. scenario. So, based okay. So if you want a scenario-based approximation and then you've got something and you're trying to relax it, I would consider a different alternative. And here's why. Once you use a scenario-based approach, you're going to, suppose you have a thousand scenarios, then your relaxation is going to have odd a thousand constraints showing up. Instead, one idea is to see whether you can smooth this. There are very clean smoothings available for max functions, and even the other function that you're saying, which has a max inside. Right. Now, what that does is that it's easily, it's easily adaptable within the stochastic approximation framework. You do not add variables. You just smooth it and take a step. And the step is still an x and omega. Mm -hmm. So there may be some benefit, but maybe we'll talk offline. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. So this is for the risk. So this is for a condition. So, uh, so, so just to make sure everybody understands why this came up. Normally, we take 
the expectation of q of x omega. It, we average the cost in the future. But suppose my concern is that if the cost in the future, I'm really worried about the tail behavior. I don't care what it is on average. I just don't want it to be too large. So I want to minimize the worst case. So one way to minimize the worst case is to use a conditional value at risk. What is the conditional value at risk? It says conditional on the random variable being beyond the value at risk level. I want to minimize the conditional expectation, right? So you could use this, you could minimize the conditional value at risk of Q of X omega if you so chose to do so. That was the idea. Is that your question? Uh, it was a bit related to the subgradients. Uh -huh, okay. why, why are we using this method rather than, uh, which, is, which gives us a choice of subgradients to choose from mm -hmm. and not doing something which is like a localized smoothing of the points where it's not so, so, so wait, wait. I don't choose the sub. Uh, uh, so the subgradient is available by solving the second stage dual problem. I'm just trying to adapt it within the gradient method. So I have a gradient method for solving convex differentiable problems. When the problem is non-smooth, I just use a stochastic subgradient method. But we choose still the subgradient. You compute it. We compute it. And yeah. We, we have a choice of different. Like in this case, the range of like we don't have a choice. I mean, that gets uh, selected entirely from the optimization because I'm, once I solve the dual problem, it gives me a subgradient. I don't care which one I get. Okay. okay. What was your question about local smoothing? I didn't understand. Uh, so instead of doing that, because you previously mentioned that we are quite okay to work with balls, instead of having like subgradients, we just smoothen the. Oh yeah. If you smoothen it, you can you can still then take a gradient with that. Yes, that's also fine. And uh, in fact, that's something that we do as well. And the thing is, the benefit is that if you have a smooth problem, then the rates are better and you can kind of always work in a smooth problem and reduce the smoothing. But you have to be very careful at the rate at which you drop the smoothing because if you drop it too fast, it becomes unstable. Yeah. Uh, so uh, does adding, I mean, uh, regularization here with this kind of thing help making the problem continue? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's a very good point. So if you look at this problem, right? Um, So if you look at this problem, C transpose X, uh, so this is the dual problem, Q transpose Y, uh, WY is equal to H minus TX, and uh, Y is non-negative, okay? Now, remember what was Q script of X? Q script of X was, you know, this, and then the subgradient was basically required you to solve this problem max of h minus tx transpose pi uh, w transpose pi is less than q or something okay now you see this problem this problem has multiple values what you do is if you regularize this and put epsilon over 2 pi squared this problem becomes strongly concave and it has a unique solution and this becomes differentiable for that realization. So the regularization in the dual gives you basically Lipsch not, just, not just continuity but differentiability of the recourse function but there's an epsilon. But the epsilon comes and you drop it to zero. That's what we've been doing. It works, it works well. But you have to be careful because you need theory to tell you the rates. So whenever you do this, you might think, I'll just hack the rate. If you hack the rate, it just doesn't work. You need to be careful about, because this rate is tied to this sequence. If you drop this too slow and that too fast, then bad things happen. So you need to understand that that's not, if, 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 if you're kind of ad hoc about it, weird things happen. At least we can get rid of the need for subgradients. Yeah, you can get rid of the needs. The, the subgradients are not problematic from that standpoint because solving LPs is easy. What is wrong here? The problem is now we're solving QPs, right? I have a QP that I'm solving, but it's a nice strongly convex QP. If you give it to Gurobi, Gurobi will solve it or Cplex will solve it. Not as fast as LPs, but reasonably fast. But we benefit because the overall rate improves. But you have to be careful when rates improve, you might, you know, there's no free lunch. The rate is improving, but you're solving QPs. So you're getting a better rate, 
but your per iteration you are solving QPs. You might have a slower rate, but you're solving it faster. So you always have to be careful. You know, you'll have optimizers putting up rates. You have to always make sure that it's apples to apples, right? Otherwise, they're comparing apples to some ghastly fruit and saying that's the same. It's not the same, right? Just you want to be careful about that. So. Okay, so, so then what, what you're allowed, you're able to get to is with this, you're able to say that Q of Xi is, is convex after you do a little bit of work, right? And that's important. Whenever you solve these problems, you need to understand, if, if you're using the vanilla problem, you get convexity. But if you're not using the vanilla problem, you might have a problem which is non-convex. And if you have a problem that is non-convex, even if you don't know how to resolve it, you need to recognize that it's non-convex. Because if you get a solution and you go and pub, you know, present that solution to your sponsor, they'll say, well, that's awful. And it may be that you've just got a really bad stationary point. It may be that the true solution is much better, right? I mean, the true global solution. So recognizing that it's non-convex is important, even if you can't solve it. So that's one of the reasons we make such a big deal of this is because you want to, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a convex problem, great. If you're unlucky enough, you need to recognize it's non-convex. Because if you go to somebody and you say, hey, look, the welfare associated with my policy is this, they say, well, that's not great, right? But, but the whole point is that if you recognize it's non-convex, you'll do a better job of getting the best solution. Then you can at least say, this is the best I've got. But if you don't recognize that you end up underselling your own work, so you want to be a little careful, okay? Um, okay, so um, so here's an important thing I want to mention. If you use a scenario-based approach, right? If you use a scenario-based approach where you sample from the scenarios and you say that's what I'm going to live by, that's my ground truth of the future. It turns out that when you do that, you can write down a single problem that corresponds to the first stage and second stage decisions. And I want to show you how to do that. That's called the deterministic equivalent, right? So the deterministic equivalent says, okay, I've got the first stage problem. Sorry, the second stage problem. Now, if you look at the second stage problem, if you look at the second stage problem, the yj's, you're solving it in yj's, right? If you look at all the second stage problems, let me, let me give you a quick, uh, ask you a quick question about this so that everybody is on the same page about coupled optimization problems. So if I gave you this problem, uh, C1, Y1, So let's take this out, okay? Okay, I've got two problems and I, can I do this? Can I do this? Because the, and why can I do, I mean, why does this give me exactly the same solution as these two separately? Because the cost function is additive and the constraints are separable. Okay? Suppose I add a requirement y1 plus x1 now I add this additional requirement. Some d1, d2. Why is that? X is a parameter. X is a parameter. X doesn't right. So essentially what happens is this can still be viewed as separable with this because this is just, you can view this as some D1 minus X, which is some H1, okay, or whatever, greater than us, right? So these are still separable. Now let's take the recourse problems. This is the recourse problem. Could I solve the recourse problem as a single problem? Yeah, because this is separable 
And each of these constraints do not have a coupling across the yj's. y1 is independent of y2, and the only thing that couples them is x, and x is already fixed. Okay? Now, so this is one gigantic linear program. Okay? And now what happens is, so what was your first stage problem? Your first stage problem was minimize C transpose x plus the optimal value of this, subject to Ax equals b. Now, it turns out that the entire two-stage problem can be solved in this way. So this is the second stage cost. And now, there is some analysis required for me to prove this, and I won't do it now. But the point is, you can solve it in one shot if you wanted to, if you had all the scenarios that you wanted to work with. Now, in the past, one of the reasons why all this other theory was developed is when, you know, this, the, the first paper on linear programming was written, it was in 1955 by George Danzig and then separately by Martin Beale. They didn't have computers to actually do this. So they had to do it in a decomposition-based framework, right? And all the way, to, and, but somewhere in this, you know, I mean, uh, it was relatively early that they, they, they observed that you could solve it as a single linear program. The only problem was that for a reasonable number of scenarios, it just wasn't feasible to do this on one computer. So you had to use decomposition. Now, today we can do that, right? Even if you had LPs of the size of 1,000 and you had 1,000 scenarios, that's still well, well within the reach of most of our, our computers, right? You can do this for some set of convex problems as well, right? So you can still solve convex problems as the deterministic equivalent. So the other avenue, instead of developing decomposition schemes or sampling schemes, if you are happy with this set of scenarios, directly solve it you know, as a deterministic equivalent. Live with it, right? Oh, the way, to, so, so then you have to, you, you, so the way to check if, if you're okay with it, so, so here the thing is that you, if you, a lot of these settings, when you get the samples, you say that's my belief regarding the way the world is going to evolve, right? Now, if you're of the belief that the true, that the, the true realization of uncertainty is from a general distribution, and this is just an approximation, then you need to use what I told you regarding sample average approximation, because this is again like a sample average. You will need to use the statements from sample average approximation theory, which relate this to some error bound. So then if you, if you can evaluate this error bound, it's still very weak. If you find that you're happy with the error, that's because this error has nothing to do with your solution. It's just an error that is a function of the problem parameters and n, where n is the number of scenarios. So if you feel like that's, for some problems, the beta is small because, you know, problems are well-conditioned, parameters are, are reasonable. And other problems, it might be nasty. But again, I have to warn you, this is quite weak. This is like C times E raised to, it's a very weak bound. So if I understand correctly, xn is deterministic, yeah, it's like from the sample, yeah. It's either from sample average approximation or from this, in this deterministic equivalent, you could replace these PJs with 1 upon K, right? You could just... S star is your recourse, it, optimal recourse, if you assume all the scenarios. No, X star, actually, so you don't have the X star, so you can't evaluate this bound because this is what the, the solution would be if you could solve the original problem. All you can do is evaluate this for your N. So suppose your N is, you know, 10,000. Yes. Now you might say, wow, this is going down at an exponential rate. It should be pretty small. But the issue is you don't know how large C is. So you need to go and check for your problem how large these are. So, you know, it gives you a way, you know, if you do it, it, it depends on, it depends on uh, the kinds of problems you're looking at. For some problems, C is going to be quite small. So a reasonable number of scenarios is enough. For other problems, which are massive problems, you expect C to be large. So for large problems, it's kind of, you know, it's, a, it's an issue, right? For large problems, you need a larger number of scenarios to get accurate solutions. The general rule of thumb is, it should be the Monte Carlo rate, right? So if N goes by a factor, by two orders of magnitude, the error goes down by one order. So if, you, if N goes from 100 to 10,000, the error goes down from 0.1 to 0 0.01. So for one jump in terms of the decimal point, you need two orders of magnitude growth. Okay, so 
yeah, it's, it's tough. You don't get as much. The, one of the ways around this is something we've been investigating called variance reduction techniques, uh, which you can use in stochastic approximation when sampling is cheap. Sa if you can sample the gradients cheaply, you can actually achieve deterministic rates of convergence. Okay, but I won't, I won't do that here. If those of you are coming for the stochastic programming conference in Norway, uh, KTH is suddenly blanking. KTH is in Norway, right? It's in Sweden, right? NTNU, I'm sorry, I got mixed up. Okay, so the stochastic programming conference is in, in, in NTNU. Some of you are going, right? You are going, yeah. So I'll be giving a, a tutorial on stochastic approximation where we'll talk about some of these schemes. Because they've become as fast as deterministic schemes under the caveat that sampling is cheap. Okay, so um, for general distributions, okay, what I want to say. Um, Okay, so I want to spend a little bit of time on the optimality conditions and the reason I want to do that is because the optimality conditions are crucial from the game theoretic standpoint to concatenate, right? We need to understand how to concatenate optimality conditions of uh, stochastic optimization problems to get solutions to the stochastic Nash game. So if I told you that I had a stochastic linear program with discrete random variables, that's what it looks like. Right, so this is the first stage and this is the second stage. Remember Q script of X now is written as its expectation. The expectation is over a finite sample space so I can write it as a finite summation. Right, so now an each second stage problem requires me to solve this. Okay, so we'll drop this, just move straight to the optimality conditions. Um, it turns out that the subgradient of the recourse function is just a finite summation then. And this D is a set of dual solutions, okay? So D is a set of dual solutions for a particular scenario, okay? Uh, and so then, let me show you. Yeah, so basically what happens is, do I have, yeah, this is what happens. So you're able to show that the optimality, bless you, the optimality conditions are essentially a complementarity problem. So look, I wanna make sure that everybody sees this. So these are complementary slackness conditions. This is C minus, this is greater than or equal to zero. And what we have is corresponding to this, you have the X bar, which is also non-negative, right? So what you have, what you have are complementarity conditions. Now, because you have finite number of scenarios, the expectation just leads to finite summation, okay? And for each pi K, you also have complementarity conditions. Okay, so now if you look at this, you might say, oh, this looks a lot like something else. And it's actually the variational inequality corresponding to the first stage problem. So if you look at the first stage problem, and this is why things get a little, a little nastier here, is when you write down the first stage problem, let's do this. If I gave you the first stage problem, You only need to worry about the first stage problem because all the information on second stage is encoded within the first stage. How do I write this? If I assume Q is continuously differentiable, it's VI X comma gradient of F plus gradient of Q, right? But what's the problem? The problem is Q is not differentiable. So when Q is not differentiable, you need to use a sub differential of Q and this becomes multi-valued. Okay, and that's why the analysis of stochastic variational inequality problems when you have two stage problems is a little nastier. Because now, up till now, we've assumed that the map we have is single valued, right? And just so that you understand physically what it means, let me give you an example. If you look at the script Q of X, right? Script Q of X is related to the sub differential. Remember the sub differential I showed you? So this value is, you know, zero at some point, one at some point, and some, another point it might be an interval, 
right? So that's why things get nasty. This is a singleton here. It's a singleton here, but here it's a set. So these are variational inequality problems where the mappings, if you put in an X, you don't get a single value outside, you get a set. So when you want to analyze them, things are a little hairier, okay? And that's why I take, yes, Latimer. Uh, uh, then the only difference between any other deterministic uh, program mm -hmm. and uh, stochastic program that this uh, non-differentiability of Q. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. So, so, so we have to be careful. So the thing is that the deterministic and stochastic is because of the fact that in this case, our second stage problem Q script X is non-differentiable. There are stochastic problems where the second stage, where you have a single stage or even a second stage where it is differentiable. Like the one Jalal was asking where you regularize. If I regularize, if I regularize and make this Q script epsilon, then this is differentiable. So the stochasticity and the differentiability should be separated. The reason why you have this is because the second stage problem is, it requires you to evaluate an optimization problem, right? You have Q script of X is what? It's the value of an optimization problem. It's not just a function. So when you try and differentiate the value of some other problem, you get non-smoothness. Okay. Uh, that might be a silly question. If the equilibrium uh, result or equilibrium point is the king point, mm -hmm. you solve it and you see that the, the yeah. red point is our equilibrium point. Yeah. Uh, does it say us something that the solution is or multiple or does it give us some intuition? So if the point is, so first of all, it's hard for us to in general tell because in, you know, in a lot of cases, unless, it's like the case Fabio was saying, for me to know it's a, a break point, like in the CVAR case, I didn't need to know what the value at risk is. So I don't always know that ahead of time, so it's hard for me to tell. Well, you could go and check, but I think rather than worry about that, what you should do is, so, so you, if you want to live with the smoothing, you can. Or you drop the smoothing and the limit, you get a solution to the original problem, mm -hmm. right? But um, suppose I were to tell you that it's the kink, what, how, would we, how would that help us? So I'm, now I'm trying to ask, is there, a, is there something that you feel like we could do with it? I don't mind thinking about it, but I'm curious what we could do. I'm not sure what we could do with it, unless somebody has, the only thing that I can think, I, I don't know, I mean, I mean, if it so happens that the solution is the kink, we, we live with it, right? Okay. Yeah, we live with it. I don't know what else to do with it. So, I mean, our, at least as a, yeah, I mean, as, a, as an algorithm designer, the goal would be to try and see whether you can get a solution to the true problem. If you're, if you're an economist, the, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, if it's, the problem is non smooth, that is the real problem. If it happens, the solution is at the kink, it's at the kink. We, I don't know what else we could. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think about, is there other reason why we would? I don't have an answer. I mean, it, somehow the knowledge that it's at the king, how does it, would it change things? I, I don't have a good answer whether it could, we could use that in some way. Potentially, you're always looking at the absolute value, right? If you if the places have in the origin, yeah. then potentially you have two different yeah. subgradients. Yeah, so potentially I mean, you have price price maybe so that's a good different. point. Yeah, maybe maybe there is something in terms of the pricing. Uh, yeah, so that's interesting because one thing that we've done in the past, this we had done in the convex hull price case because we were using subgradients. Um, I think there we tried something like this because if you go to a stakeholder. And if it so happens that you're at the kink, then the question is that which price did you use? And is there a price that you could use that would be more beneficial to us? Now, of course, that's discriminatory. Yeah. But the question is that there is some, so that's a very good point, right? So maybe, maybe if, there, if this thing has some economic intuition in terms of prices and we have some play, maybe there is a price that is more beneficial. Yeah. And that's often the case when you have subgradients because gradients refer to prices. Similar, you get something like this. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, should we stop here? Yeah, yeah. Should we stop here? Yeah, yeah. It's already. Yeah, let's stop here.